Welcome to Spotlight ETSU. I'm your host, Carrie Oliveira. Today I'll be speaking with Dr. Ted Olson about his work preserving the history and of folk and country music in Appalachia. Dr. Olson was nominated for two Grammys at the 2012 Awards for his work writing and producing the Bristol Sessions box set. He's also written and edited many works highlighting the region's rich musical history. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Olson. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Appreciate it. We're, we're so excited to have you today. Um, we want to talk about all the interesting things that you do on this campus and in your professional life. But first, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and where you came from and how it is you ended up at ETSU. Sure. When, when people ask where I'm from, I often say, you know, I'm from Appalachia, but I'm really from northern Appalachia. I'm from the western part of Massachusetts which has, of course, a lot of mountains, the right. Berkshires. But I moved to Washington, D.C. when I was younger with my parents who were uh, educators and, and, and worked for the government. Mm -hmm. And while living in Washington, D.C., I met a lot of people from Appalachia who had themselves moved to Washington to find work. Right. You know, lots of jobs in Washington for the government and such. Yes. So I met a lot of people from Washington. Uh, people, some of them were performers, musicians, people like... Hazel Dickens and, and John Jackson. These are well-known and well-respected Appalachian musicians. Mm -hmm. I heard them play down at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival down on the mall in Washington. Oh, how uh, cute. And how, how old were you when that would have happened? A uh, teenager. Oh. So it made quite an impression on me, yeah. really. Um, also very important in Washington is an organization, a federal organization called the Appalachian Regional Commission. Oh. And this is a kind of a federal-state partnership organization that provides money, economic support and such to certain counties in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. And so as a teenager, I became aware of this organization and their very important work in the Appalachian region. And I actually, a friend of mine's father was a lawyer for the ARC, as it's often called, Appalachian Regional Commission. Mm -hmm. So as a teenager, I became well aware of their economic work right. in Appalachia. Um, this, uh, the father of my friend kept giving me books about Appalachia when I was a teenager, and I read them. And it just snuck in there. <laughs> it kind of snuck in. And it got, you know, piqued my interest in Appalachia. So by the time I was in high school, I'd take weekend trips out to Appalachia, out to the Shenandoah National Park mm -hmm. and, and the eastern part of West Virginia, you know, to kind of see the mountains for myself, yeah. meet Appalachian people. Um, eventually, I became affiliated with a camp that's in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. And I was, uh, in essence, I was uh, a naturalist and a folklorist there. I taught children from Washington, D.C. who came to the camp about the mountains. You know, I would take them on field trips. And oh. one, one of the things that we did was we started a folklore program. And so the folklore program basically was an opportunity for Washington children to meet, you know, mountain folk oh, and neat. to visit them in their homes learn how they lived, and I, I, I thought it was very important to get people from different walks of life meeting one another. Yes. Some of the, the children from D.C., they would come to the camp with certain notions about what mountain life was like, you know, yes. including stereotypes, sure. you know. And so one of the goals was to make the children realize that, you know, these, these are real folk who have real interesting lives. And right. they, they don't understand them, maybe, but they, they, they could have the potential of befriending them if they yes. spend time with them. And so some, you know, some real friendships were forged between people of, you know, shall we say, senior citizens of Appalachia and children from Washington. It was a real oh my goodness. fun project. That's so, so neat. So that was one of the things I did. Um, that kind of led to the next uh, step. After five years with the camp, working there in the uh, summer seasons and such, mm -hmm. running the folklore program in West Virginia, I then moved to North Carolina in the western part of the mm -hmm. state worked for the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park as a park ranger. And so that was a different sort of interpretive job where I was kind of interpreting Appalachia for, for, uh, for people who weren't familiar with Appalachia. Right, like the physical elements of Appalachia, like yeah. less the people, more the mountains kind of a yeah. thing, I would imagine. Well, my primary job was interpreting the mountains, the, um, the, the geology, the flora and fauna, but I, I snuck in a lot of stories about the local folklore in my talks to the visitors to the park. And, and eventually, in fact, I started to uh, do an, uh, a living history um, role there where I would actually, in the Smokies, I would actually kind of try to uh, demonstrate certain kinds of traditions for visitors and that sort of thing, which oh, neat. allowed me to kind of uh, experience the culture from the inside, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 truthfully, I wasn't of the inside. I was still, you know, the, 
the uh, young person from Washington who was right. very much uh, enthralled by Appalachian culture and Appalachia as, as a place and as a region. But I was learning something about what it felt like to live in those mountains, yes. in, in the mountains of, of Appalachia. So um, in essence, I worked for the National Park Service in Appalachia for seven years. After seven years of that, I realized that my knowledge base needed to be expanded. So mm -hmm. I, in essence, went back to school, got some graduate degrees, and came to ETSU in 1999. And I've been working with the uh, Center for Appalachian Studies and Services and the Department of Appalachian Studies uh, ever since. That's so neat. I, I'm, I, I know that I've, my, I've, I've been on this campus for five and a half years, I guess, and one of the things that I think is so interesting about this campus is that we have an entire department devoted to the study of Appalachian studies. And so it's like, it, I, I think it's always very important to study the culture of the place that you are entrenched, right? Yeah, and yeah, so I think yeah. that's, that's such a nifty thing. Um, so you're a storyteller. Well, in a sense, I'm a storyteller. I'm maybe not a storyteller in the sense that we come to associate them with Jonesboro. Right, the, the Jonesboro Storytelling, storytelling right. Festival. I mean, you know, I've done some of that a little bit, but um, I tell stories through songs. Yes. You know, I sing a lot of ballads, which are songs that tell stories, and I accompany those performances on the banjo and the guitar and perform at festivals and in school classrooms and for senior citizens groups and things like that. Um, so I've done a lot of that over the last several decades. Um, beyond that, I do a lot of writing, you know, and, and that yes. involves an element of storytelling. Yes. <laughs> when you write uh, stories from history, stories from experiences, and w while sometimes I write in prose, sometimes I write in poetry, but a lot of the poems I write have a narrative element. They tell stories. Yeah, and you produced a, or you published a book of poetry. When was that? Breathing in Darkness. Oh, that was about five years ago, and it was a... It was a full-length uh, collection of poems. Uh, most of them were written in Appalachia, uh, some of which were written in these very mountains of East Tennessee, some of them in Western North Carolina, and, and uh, some of the poems written elsewhere. But um, I think the interesting thing for me was, um, of course, I've been a big fan of Appalachian literature, so it was mm -hmm. nice to you know, have, the, have my poems out there in a book so that I could kind of maybe have a small part of that uh, experience Be of being a among writer that, of, yeah. among those wonderful writers that uh, many people worldwide appreciate. So, you know, I'm not sure how w widely my book has been read, but I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to have been part of that experience of publishing work and having it read by others and appreciated, hopefully, by others. Certainly. So, so you like, and so park ranger and enjoying Appalachia and musician and storyteller, like you just fantastically fascinating. And so you bring all of that to ETSU, but we're gonna talk first about like your professional life, sure. where you were nominated for Grammys, like Grammy Awards, that's really cool. I've never met a Grammy nominee <laughs> before, so I'm pretty excited about that. What were, what were you nominated for? Well, um, I worked on a project in 2010 it was released in 2011, mm -hmm. and it was the Bristol Sessions, mm -hmm. 1927, 1928, The Big Bang of Country Music is the full title. But it was a big box set that was uh, released by a German record company called Bear Family Records. Bear Family- A German company. Yeah, okay. the, the record company is in Germany. They're pretty well known for taking a, a strong interest in releasing American music. So oh. even though they're based in Germany, their primary interest is American music. Okay. Which, uh, you know, the, the CEO and founder of the label is a huge fan of American music of all types. That's cool. In okay. essence, in 2010, I sent him an email and I said, you know, here's a project idea. What do you think? The Bristol sessions of 1927 and 1928 have never been fully released, would you like me to work on something like this for you? I heard back from him within a matter of a few minutes. He said, yes, yes. <laughs> let's do this. Um, so we put it together working with a nice team of uh, professionals. Uh, you know, the, 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 those old records had to be mastered or shall we say remastered right. in the digital form. But we work with top of the line uh, people in every facet of the production end. Um, and we put out this box set. It was released in early 2011 mm -hmm. on the birthplace of Country Music Alliance in Bristol, Bristol. Um, which of course makes as one of its primary missions to promote the legacy of the Bristol Sessions, which occurred, you know, of course, in 27 and 28. Having said that, I, yeah. I'm like, I've been a fan of country music. Yeah. 
poppy stuff, don't judge. But, you know, country music has always been in my mind. And, you know, coming here just by happenstance and finding out that Bristol is the birthplace of country music and, you know, where all of this wonderfulness comes mm -hmm. from. I don't know. I had never heard of the Bristol Sessions before I found out I was going to interview you. So can you give us a little bit of backstory on what specifically the Bristol Sessions refer to? Right. Well, Johnny Cash once said that the Bristol Sessions were the single most important event in the history of country music. And that is probably true. So that's a, Cash said it. Yeah. <laughs> if he said, of course. Now, some people would say he had a little bit of kind of a special a connection to the Bristol Sessions. I mean, he was married to the daughter of Carter, one of, the, right? yeah, one, of the, one of the people discovered in Bristol. But that being said, others who didn't have any connection to the Bristol Sessions have said very similar things, have claimed that they're one of, in fact, the Library of Congress claimed that the Bristol Sessions were one of the very most important recording sessions of all time of any type of music. Good grief. Um, so what the Bristol Sessions were, in essence, were the, I would describe it as maybe, in some ways, not the creation of country music as a commercial genre, because right. really that dates back to 1923. Um, 1923 is when the first records were made of anything that approaching what we would call today country music. Really what they were were folk songs, right. but they, they kind of became subsumed by the country music label later on. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the first artist recorded was Fiddlin John Carson, and he was a fiddler in North Georgia. And he wandered into a studio. I mean, the, the studios in those years were pretty makeshift. They right. were set up temporarily in the South to record artists. Most of the records in 1923 that were being made in Atlanta that, that summer were uh, blues records, you know, African American right. music, which was all the rage in the early 20s. Yes. So here was this uh, man from North Georgia walking in wanting to play music of the white tradition of the mountains. And the producer's name was Ralph Peer. Ralph Peer was an industry pioneer. He was really the foremost 1920s agent of the recording industry. I mean, probably the single most important figure in early years of, of the recording industry. And he was making blues records in, 19, in the 19, early 20s in Atlanta and elsewhere. Of course, he did this elsewhere. But in Atlanta, Fiddlin' John Carson walks in the studio, says, I, I want to record some of my old favorite fiddle tunes. And R Ralph Peer was very skeptical. He didn't think that this type of music would have a fan base. But he was an right. open-minded businessman. He said, right. we'll give it a try. We'll see what happens. He got a furniture salesman to kind of underwrite the production costs because that was important. Right. The furniture stores are important because they sold the records, you see, because right. that's where the, the record players were right. sold. Phonographs. Phonographs and, and the, the Victrolas and such. So um, Fid, uh, Fiddlin' John Carson had the first country records in 1923. Uh, in essence, it was discovered almost immediately that there was an audience for this music. So more and more records were made from 23 to 26, let's say. Okay. The problem was is that the recording equipment was kind of what we would call very primitive, mm -hmm. by, by certainly by any certainly kind by of modern, modern standards. standards. <laughs> they were very primitive. They were using what was called an acoustic microphone. And if anyone isn't familiar with that, do you know those? If anyone can envision the old Elvis records that have the picture of the dog listening to his master's voice coming out of the, the, the Victrola yes. uh, re record player, and there was a horn yes. amplifier, the projecting sound up. Well, that horn was the same thing that would actually gather sound waves in for the cutting of a record. So that was the old style microphone, it was a horn. People would actually kind of play music in or, or sing into a, 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 a horn. Funnel. <laughs> right, exactly, a funnel. Mm -hmm. Um, very imprecise way to kind of record music. Certainly. And so the dynamic ranges on those early records are pretty, pretty poor. Mm. Um, but by 1926, a new electronic microphone, something looking like a modern style microphone, right. had been invented and introduced. So what the Bristol Sessions were, I, even though we call the project the Big Bang of country music, some people think that comes to mean the invention of country music. Right. And what I usually like to say is it's really the invention of modern country music. Sure. So that's really why the, the phrase makes some sense. I mean, yes, country music existed before. Everyone knows that. But the Bristol Sessions created a modern sensibility of you know, trained musicians, you know, or at least very talented amateurs mm -hmm. who had a, a, a high level of talent um, performing material often that they wrote themselves. And that's important yes. because the Bristol Sessions really encourage artists to sing uh, their own songs. And I should point out, 
that the producer of the Bristol Sessions was none other than Ralph Peer, the same gentleman who discovered Fiddlin' John Carson right. and recorded the first country records in 1923. He was the gentleman who came to Bristol in 1927 with the electronic microphone system. And during two weeks in July and August, um, 19 different musical acts came into his makeshift studio on State Street in Bristol. Um, two of those acts later became legendary, well, pretty quickly became legendary, Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. Yeah. Huh? They had never recorded before, but this was their f these were their first recordings in Bristol, and so they sold like hotcakes. Yeah. And <laughs> I think more important than even the fact that they sold a lot of records uh, would be the fact that their records had such a high quality level. Yes. And so that really set the bar high for anything that came later. Well, and I would imagine, too, it's very hard to develop a fan base when the music doesn't sound on a recording like it's supposed to. Like, it doesn't yeah. when you're sitting in front of the musician, you're like, what? you're not capturing the truth of it. And right. it's very hard to come to appreciate, I would imagine. And sure. So being able to, that high recording quality probably is incredibly instrumental in the development of modern country yeah. music. Oh. You can tell that, too, when you listen to the CDs, because if you listen to a CD transfer mm -hmm. of the Bristol Sessions, for the most part, they sound if not crystal clear, they sound quite good. Oh my goodness. Considering that they're 80 plus years old, yeah. they sound, you can hear people breathing before they sing and that kind of thing, lifelike almost. Yes. If you listen to recordings made before the introduction of the electronic microphone, mm -hmm. people singing and performing through the uh, horn uh, microphone, yes. uh, you kind of hear a far lower uh, level of kind of audio fidelity. It yes. doesn't sound lifelike, it doesn't sound real. So the Bristol Sessions just stand out. They leapt out as you know, state-of-the-art recordings by state-of-the-art musicians. And so that's why they have such a legendary reputation. And, and you had asked about the Grammys. Yes. Well, basically, in November, November 30th, they announced them. Uh, I learned from one of my colleagues on the project that you know, my work had been recognized, as well as a couple of my colleagues, in two areas. One was liner notes. We put together a 120-page book to accompany the CD box set that's mm -hmm. with, that people get when they buy the box set, they get the book. So we were nominated for the liner notes, and we were also nominated for the, the, the whole package, the production of the whole box set. Right. And so it was in the category of best historical recording. So that's what, what I love about that, you know, just in talking to you, is it, it seems to be this a very appropriate convergence of music and history and folklore that you seem to value very much. And so that had to be really trippy for you to be honored with a Grammy nomination for doing just what it seems you're inclined to do in your life, I, I would imagine. Sure, sure, that's exactly right. It's basically you do what you do because you believe in it. Right. You know, countless wonderful projects have been done that have great historical importance and aesthetic importance and never received a nomination. Right. It doesn't invalidate them in one Not iota. at all, right. And so to be nominated for something that you believe in deeply, it's just like uh, frosting on the cake. Yes. You know, and it was an interesting experience, you know, going to the Grammy Awards to actually witness uh, how, p what people felt about this old time music, you know. I, I talked to a lot of people about this box set, you know, just in conversations, and right. you know, some had already heard about it, some never had heard about the Bristol Sessions. So, basically, I, I felt like I was serving a little bit as an ambassador of Appalachia yes. to a, you know, a world that wasn't a generally ignorant community. I guess they weren't necessarily aware of the old-time country music heritage. Right, and by the way, it's beautiful. I'm just gonna show everybody our box set here. This, this is the packaging for the, it's heavy. There's a big old book in here, and the, is it four CDs? Uh, there are five CDs. Five CDs, uh -huh. it's a big old bonus, but it's beautiful, and State Street, and it's just fantastic. And I was flipping through the pages of the book before we started interviewing, and the photographs are beautiful, and was it difficult to acquire those photographs, or did, how did you get those? Well. Um, some of those photos in the book within the package have never been seen before other than maybe one or two archivists, you know, that sort of thing. They had never been published before. Um, I had a little help from a handful of collectors of old photographs mm -hmm. who were very generous. A gentleman named Gary Rose who works for ETSU had his own personal archives. He was very generous. The Birthplace of Country Music Alliance were very generous with their archives. And then, of course, a lot of individual owners of rare photos were very generous to submit their images, you know, share them with us. So 
you know, a package like this requires many people to work together. Yes. And, you know, they're listed on the, on the album, all those who contributed. But uh, let's put it this way, it was a collaborative effort. Yes. And, yes, we do have a lot of rare photos in there. And a lot of, a lot of stories are told within that book that were never told before because we did a lot of original research to get those stories about the artists who participated in right. Bristol and, and the overarching story of the Bristol Sessions, what they symbolized, how, how they've come to be seen as very important in the l long range, you know. Catalytic. Uh, catalytic, I, right? absolutely. <laughs> they were the catalyst of modern country music. I think that's an excellent way to put it. That's fantastic. And it's, it's really very beautiful. And I, like, congratulations to you on that. It's fantastic. What I love about this is that you're on our campus. Here you are, and a folklorist and storyteller and musician and wonderful, and you teach here, and so our students have the benefit of you. And so tell me what about what you do on our campus, where do you teach, what do you teach, what do you got coming on, say, in the summer that we might be able to take advantage of? Okay. Well, let's see here. I've been affiliated with the Center for Appalachian Studies and Services since I came on campus mm -hmm. in 1999. I've also taught classes for, say, the departments of uh, literature and languages, mm -hmm history, sociology and anthropology, Master of Arts in Liberal Studies, and a Who haven't couple you taught others. for? Accounting. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, I, I have not taught for accounting, uh, or business, or many others. Right, right. But I, you know, skill, skill set only, you know, Indeed. goes so far. So, but I've taught for a number of departments. Basically, it's because my, my work is what we call interdisciplinary. Yes. You know, I try to weave different fields together and draw connections between, um, you know, elements of culture that, you know, historically had been relegated to maybe one specific department. Yes. You know, our modern era looks to kind of, uh, shall we say, find unities, find connections between uh, disparate academic fields. Well, so my understanding of the Appalachian Studies program in general is that it's fundamentally in interdisciplinary. It, doesn't have, it has a, right. a small curriculum unto itself, but mm -hmm. a lot of the required courses they in the major, the, the programs, it, are from other departments as Absolutely. well, if I understand that correctly. It is an interdisciplinary program. Uh, we have a, a recently uh, developed department of Appalachian Studies, so mm -hmm. that's in the last few years, and now I'm a, a full member of that, so of the new department. So. You know, before I was with the center and helped other departments. Mm -hmm. Now I'm with the Department of Appalachian Studies, but still help other other departments. Um, you asked about what classes I teach. Yes. Well, just some examples. I teach the uh, history of country music class. Um, you know, history of folk music class. Um, some of these are in the classroom. Some of these are online, so people might be interested in teach? knowing about that. I I can't. I imagine missing something of the experience of learning about, I mean, it's a realize it's a history class, but still online. Like, you're a great storyteller. I imagine they missed something in not being in the classroom with you. Will, Do your students, like, notice this at all? Well, I, I guess what we would say is that there's different approaches towards learning. Um, this is true. A lot of younger people respond to the online approach. This they, is true. They like to kind of guide their own kind of development through the class. You know, they can kind of pick their time periods mm -hmm. of study. They don't necessarily have to be at a classroom at a particular time. Um, we do have a lot of interactive media online that they can utilize in an online class. That's good. Music classes loan themselves very nicely to that kind of element. So, um, so I, yeah, I teach music classes. I teach literature classes. I teach a Scottish and Irish literature class, for example, for the uh, what used to be the English department, the mm -hmm. Department of uh, mm -hmm. Literature and Languages. Mm -hmm. Uh, currently it's called. Um, I teach in the summer, I'll be teaching two classes this summer that people might be interested in. One is called uh, the Hillbilly Stereotype, Oh, which is uh, a class exploring the historical evolution of the stereotype of Appalachian people as hillbillies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a term that has been used in very negative ways yes. in the past. It's been used in, we would say, kind of quietly positive ways in the past. Mm -hmm. For example, Country music, before it was called country music, was called hillbilly music. But it wasn't used as a pejorative. Yes. It was used as a kind of a, just a, a label of where it comes from, a label of ethnicity. Right. So, so we look at the history of the term hillbilly. We look at the way uh, you know, the negative uses have really hurt Appalachian people in the past. You know, kind of people from Appalachia leave to go elsewhere, maybe wherever outside of the region, and they end up receiving stereotyped, uh, re, you know, uh, perceptions from the people they meet. Right. And they have to deal with it. They have to confront them in their interactions with people from different places. Well, I had a very weird experience coming here. I, 
culture in Hawaii is really not all that dissimilar from Appalachian okay. culture. There are some uh -huh. very, very close similarities. I tend to run around without my shoes on. And so I'll, I'll like run down the hall from my office to my class without my shoes on. And I got like, my students were like, oh, you're being a hillbilly. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh -huh. Like, hillbillies don't have shoes. Like, what are you talking about? So as a person coming into this region mm -hmm. from outside, having no frame of reference for it, even hearing the stereotypes from locals mm -hmm. is a very interesting sort of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, helping yeah. me orient myself in this environment uh -huh. by way of stereotypes sure. was a very curious experience for me. Right. And so I, right. that would be fantastically interesting, I would right. imagine. Are you, you're teaching that one in the in summer? In the summer, second summer session. Sun, session two, and that one is face-to-face -face or online? That is an actual classroom experience. That's, That's cool. That's a traditional class experience. Traditional. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people interested, in, uh, that class is offered between the, the anthropology and sociology department, mm -hmm. the history department, and the Appalachian studies department. So people can take credit in any one of those three departments and still take the same class. Ah, cool. And, and actually, it's, it's quite interesting to hear to have people from different uh, kind of backgrounds in the same classroom because they, they, they approach the subject of hillbilly stereotyping from different yes. perspectives. And uh, I can say that we tend to get some people not from the region as well as people from the region. And there are different perceptions of, of how, to re how to respond to uh, the hillbilly stereotype. And Maybe I would imagine there's variation in how negative certain aspects of the stereotype are depending on where you're from or what you're discipline from. you're studying it from. And your own personal experience. Yes. Because you know we have people from in the classroom t who take the class from Appalachia who aren't really bothered by the stereotypes. They've just consciously dealt with them and put the stereotypes aside with everything they've done. Mm -hmm. Others have been definitely hurt by them and yes. they, they share their experiences. And so it's a, it's a wonderful learning experience and I, I do believe that um, it's a class in which people get to the heart and soul of the attitude of Appalachia yes. outside the region through taking that class. They learn to see how the media, how, how the you know, various other Americans have viewed uh, Appalachians over the years, and, and, and you know, knowledge is empowering. It, it, Absolutely, it kind of diffuses the power of of the negative element of the stereotype, and and maybe puts more positive elements of the stereotype into perspective. You know, I'm referring now to television shows like The Waltons, you know, yes. which is a very positive representation, very wholesome, wholesome, right? But nonetheless, a stereotype too. So we, we look we look at all aspects of the story. Right. The, the other class I'm teaching in the summer is going to be an online class called Appalachia and War. Oh. And so we'll be looking at the wartime experiences involving Appalachian people, whether the wars occurred in Appalachia, such as in the 18th century and right. Civil War and that sort of thing, or whether Appalachian people left the mountains to fight in, in national or you know foreign wars. Yes. Um, so we, we're going to be looking at, at these elements, and it will be an online class experience. So. And when that when what's which summer session is that one? That will be then? second summer session as well. Also summer too. Yeah. Are you doing something cool during the beginning of the summer that well, while you're not teaching? Well, that's I, I hope to do some research involving comparative. Uh, regional studies. In other words, you had referred to Hawaii a little bit yes. ago. Um, <laughs> and that's very important because I believe in a lot of ways that's the future of Appalachian studies. W scholars you know, in the field are increasingly wanting to look at the case of people living in Appalachia mm -hmm. and growing up in the region and dealing with the stereotypes that are leveled against them by people who don't understand the culture, yes. um, haven't lived in the region. Um, it ends up being the case that a lot of people all over the world also receive certain stereotype notions from other people. Yes. Generally speaking, people of what we would maybe call marginalized cultures mm -hmm. tend to get discriminated by the dominant cultures yes. or, the, or the larger population, more politically powerful cultures. And so what I hope to do in the early part of the summer is do some comparison, comparisons between Appalachian cultures and other mountain cultures yeah. around the world. So I hope to do some field research. So traveling then, possibly. Perhaps, yes, oh, hopefully. that would be so exciting. Yeah. I have been so excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much for your time. I have learned a lot. I'm so excited. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Olson. We have been speaking with Dr. Ted Olson about his work preserving the history in Appalachian folk and country music. Join us next time on Spotlight ETSU. Thank you. Thank you.